coaches, welcome back to another Modern Soccer Coach interview. This week we are joined by Jez George, Head of Football at Lincoln City FC. Phenomenal insight on football culture at a club, strategy, long-term planning, philosophy, processes, coach selection, coach recruitment, data, analysis, development, so much in this interview. I hope you enjoy it. Please give it a like and subscribe if you do. Huge thanks to Jez for jumping on. Please check out the new Modern Soccer Coach preseason deal, new package we've got below, 50% off the resources. If you're planning for upcoming preseason, definitely worth checking out. Ebooks, resources, webinars, all available, 50% off. Check it out on the link below. Thanks so much for the support. Here is Jez. Enjoy. Jez, thank you so much for joining me today on the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. Very, very excited to have you on. My pleasure. Good to be here, Gary. Yours is a really, really interesting, specific, unique role that seems to be growing in football where clubs that don't have the resources to go out with a blank checkbook and, and buy who they want, they're going to have to develop their own talent. You obviously believe that you can develop and do results at the same time. So can you talk us through philosophy around that? Yeah, and I think I, I can, but I think it also has to fit what the club needs. So maybe if if we had the biggest budget in League One, and we were able to sign all the most experienced players with a proven track record, um, perhaps we wouldn't have to create this as a model. Perhaps we would look at things slightly differently. So we look at it from, from a first instance as not an ego thing, not um, something that we want to do for, for a, you know for vanity's sake. It's like, how are we going to overachieve as a football club? We, we are going to have roughly a mid-table ranked budget, and we want to be competitive at the top end of the league, and we want to try and get promoted so we, we need to overachieve. So to do that, recruitment is a massive part of that. And we have to bring players in that are likely not to have already achieved in League One. And we have to be the club that gives them the platform to do so. So they're going to come a little bit earlier in the curve than some clubs might be able to sign players. So for us to fulfil their potential, those players with us, we have to create, we believe, an environment where they can develop individually. So for us... The, the job of the head coach and, and the coaching staff, it's a real specialism. We're looking for them to develop the individual because the majority of our players are going to come here pre-peak in their careers and develop the collective and find a way of playing and a game model that achieves everything we want, which is to develop the individual because those players can be future assets for the football club. So as well as helping us to get to where we want to go, they might help us beyond them being here if we can sell them for the right amount of money and reinvest that we have to play in a way that can get results because we're in a results business and we want to overachieve and overachieving is measured by league tables and is measured by you know what happens every saturday and, and tuesday but we also have to play in a way we believe that resonates with our fan base and engages like we're lucky we have a really good fan base at lincoln we can get close to filling our stadium every time we play football so we have to engage those nine thousand people at home to make it a really, really tough venue for the opposing team to come. So, yeah, it can't just be abstract. It has to have some relevance to the football club. But we honestly believe with the type of players we sign, I'll flip it, if we don't develop, we're never going to get results. So we don't see them as polar opposites or contradictions. We actually see them as like creating the virtuous circle where one creates the other and then the other reinforces the next. Almost the, the nature of, especially English football, there are, there are going to be up and down, ups and downs in every single league in the world. The nature of English football with the game schedule and the, the league's intensity. I mean, we look at that over here in America and say, wow, we would yeah. love to have that. But yes, they, that, that comes with a, a massive like short-term lens. So I understand that aspect of it as well. What what I'm also very very interested in is is seeing how when results maybe aren't going or you're in a bad spell or you're you know, not where you want to be from a results standpoint. What are what are some metrics or some ways that you look at development to say we are we're trending or we're making progress in that aspect? Yeah, and, and look, it's a really pertinent point, Gary, because the the reality is football's a, a low scoring sport. Therefore, you don't always get the result that the performance deserves. That's the reality. And the margins for winning and losing are really fine. But we live in a world, don't we, where it's binary. So if you win, you're brilliant. If you lose, you're the opposite. And somewhere we have to keep calm heads when results, even the opposite, when results are really, really good, 
we may have to understand that that won't continue for very long because we're massively overachieving and actually there's some underlying problems. So everybody always looks at it as to how do you react to a number of defeats when actually you've got to be just as cognizant and aware of overperforming in the short term with results. I think, and again, maybe an example is just this last year. So in the second half of this season, I think we equaled Portsmouth with a number of points. We took 42 points from our last 21 games. We went 16 games unbeaten. But the precursor to the 16 games unbeaten was nine without a win. And over Christmas, we had four consecutive losses. So I think we've almost lived that. And, and I can talk to you about, you know, metrics, feel and everything. But we're really process driven as a football club. Um, that comes from everywhere. That comes from ownership. That comes from board. That comes from governance. Um, but we want the head coach to be really process driven as well, because that gives us a belief. If we're talking about developing individual players we're talking about having a young team we had the third youngest in league one last year the year before we were the youngest so we're always going to have players who have potential to fulfill we just believe you have to have good process and actually judging the process is more important potentially than just the outcome because over a small number of games i think you can win football matches without a process it just won't last very long and i think you can also have bad results for other reasons. So we were aware coming into the January transfer window that we had a paucity of strikers, we had some injuries, we had several problems with the squad. We knew we had a really tough run of fixtures over Christmas. Um, so we almost expected and we preempt that results might be really difficult here and we're going to have to scramble and find a way of surviving, staying alive um, until we get to the 1st of January. We know what we need to do in the 1st of January. We know what the squad needs. We know then that we've got three or four senior players coming back from injury that by the by the end of January, beginning of February, um, the squad will look a lot different. So from just the common sense perspective and just looking at the bigger picture and knowing, you know, the game is, however good coaches are, the game's about players. And if you've got good availability of your best players, you're likely to win more games than when you haven't. So we have to support the head coach through that. And especially a head coach that, is in his first role and we've just appointed we, we have to make sure as a club we're really really strong and i see through that process um the quality of the work at the training ground i get the behind the lens look if you like so you know the product is what we see on a saturday at three o'clock but I, I get to see what happens from monday to friday and you see the quality of the work you see the detail you see the way that we're operating in that gives you some belief and then there's some underlying metrics. Of course, we look at those. We have a style of play that has evolved and become like a really clear identity for the club. And, and therefore, you can measure certain aspects of that in your performance analysis and your reviews to know that, look, we are making progress, but there's often a lag behind performances to results. So the start of that run started with a, a really lucky 93rd minute equaliser away at Wickham sliced in, looped over the lad on the line. If Ethan Array had tried that 100 times, he'd only score once. But it gave us an equaliser in front of a big away following. Brilliant moment of connection between the players and the supporters. Built belief. Next two home games of Peterborough and Derby, two really, really tough games. Drew both of them nil-nil, but had standing ovations off in both games because, again, performance levels were getting better and better and better. And then the first win comes when we're down to 10 men after 30 minutes away at Burton and we scramble a 1-0. So football is just such an inexact science if you look at any small enough sample size. But if you look at it over a period and you start looking at what's the process, what's the quality of work, what are the underlying metrics, how's the performances, I think it helps you to get past the bumps in the road that sometimes are poor results in the short term. How does that whole process work around, I guess, education of not just technical staff but is there an education then around the club of hey listen this is the reality of what we're in you know is there I mean, do you have to have a private conversations with people uh with their expectations with it too yeah look, we're, we're really really fortunate as a football club gary I don't, I don't know if it's fortunate or we're blessed but we have brilliant ownership you know so Clive Nates, Harvey Jabara, um, Ron Fowler's just joined as, a, as, a, as an investor as well. T two of those guys are from your side of the pond as well. Um, and maybe I, I can say from my personal experience, then redressing maybe the, the bad rap that some American owners get, because that's like a really lazy thing, isn't it? Like that's typical of British football. Um, we've got another couple of guys, Jay Wright, David Lowe's, who sit on 
like football exec boards and 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 like the the governance structures and my boss like the chief exec here Liam Scully exceptional so we have just really really good people above us really sensible people who understand the challenges um and understand the landscape we work in so I think that's where and you know we may come on to this but I think that's where the the narrative to the supporters um, and the way that the club conducts itself publicly and the way that we try and you know bring people on the journey with us and, and understand the challenges that we face that helps because let, let's just put it in blunt terms like we're talking about some young men here like they go on a football pitch and we expect them to be perfect but they're young they're in their early 20s they haven't had loads and loads of life experiences and we're asking them to perform so you know as a football club we have to support them in every way we can so some of that is the fan base. Some of that is what it looks like on match day. And some of that is being really, really consistent in your messages at the training ground and making sure the staff never get too high, never get too low. And, and there's just a consistency because, look, we all know, don't we, the first thing they'll do after the game finishes is switch on their mobile phones and then they'll open the world of social media. And, and that will be a very exaggerated feedback process if you want so they're either going to be you know it's going to be one end of the scale or the other depending on the results so I think it's incumbent on us to create that consistency for them I think on a day-to-day -day basis at the training ground it's interesting how people talk about data and people talk about you know laptop coaches and modern world and stuff like that and how different spheres, spheres collide if you want I think it's really healthy to have lots of people with different backgrounds I think you have to get the balance right because we're here as a football club and we have to people with football experiences. But I think anybody who can provide a slightly different lens on the same subject is really advantageous. And if you've got open minded coaching staff and again, Marcus Scabala is a exceptionally intelligent, um, open minded head coach. You can use um, data. You can use different perspectives to help you make a sensible and rational assessment of where you are. And that's all we use data for, really. It's it's eye checks. It's making sure that what we believe we see is actually what, you know, the data tells us. This part of football, I think, is a feel. I, I do. I think it's intuition. I think it's players, how they feel in a game drives belief and confidence. And it's the intangible that's very, very important. You can't be so cold as just to go, we had X, Y, and Z in terms of like stats. I think games ebb and flow, momentum, goals change games, goals change the momentum, but little details in games can change that. And helping players understand how to manage the flow and the momentum of games and the feel of games is important. Um, but I think, yeah, I've given you a really long answer there, but I think the answer really is you have to take everybody's experiences and have a different set of experiences within the staff overall and within the coaching staff to give the players like the best provision possible. It's a lot easier said than done because there are so many little nuances around a football club about people. Yeah, hundred um, percent. So Fer Alex Ferguson, I always remember, and years and years ago, was a quote about did he want a psychologist? And he asked, if "You bring another person, and you bring another opinion." I guess when you're when you're looking at, and I, I do this a lot with the analysis piece of modern soccer coach. When we when we're looking when we're talking to analysts, young analysts, I guess what I'm asking is there a bit of education around the the, the young people that are coming in who maybe don't have that intangible, or do they learn by the processes, or how does that work? It's a really good question, and uh, I'll just really really briefly just tell you about a young man who who did the job for 12 months for us, and we just lost him. Um, but we've lost him how you want to lose people, you know, so he's he's a New Zealand lad. He's really, really young. We thought he's brilliant and he's turned out to be brilliant. And now he's with the New Zealand national team. He's going to go to the Olympics with them and then prep for the World Cup. So if you're going to lose someone, lose them to their native country to work for their national team. But I think there's two parts of this. Um, and so now we're, we're trying to recruit to replace him. So you are always, I believe, when you're recruiting staff, you are looking for their technical competency. Without that, you can't employ them. So there has to be, and it's a specialism. And I think football's becoming more of an industry where it wants specialists. You know, if you look back 20 years ago, there was lots of people who were multifunctioned and had a bit of knowledge of a bit of things, but mostly it was just like football people in football. I think now there's been an understanding and acceptance, and we've probably been behind other sports in bringing people in without maybe that professional football background but have a real specialism in an area that will enhance performance and therefore results. So that's definitely the role of the analyst, isn't it? Most usually 
university background, academic background, quite young, lack some probably life experiences and definitely lack professional football experiences. So technical competency has got to be ticked. Then, then I think it is the person. And that's the intuition or the judgment that you try and make. But Gary, we do the same when we try and sign players. We, we actually look at them as, okay, there's a footballer here and we want to bring them in to execute four or five key roles in that position. But we have to sign a good character. We have to sign someone who wants to learn, who wants to develop, who's on the journey that we want to take them on. Because if that player isn't coming here for the reason we want them to come here, it won't work. So we, we have to sign hungry, ambitious, um, talented, but probably, again, early in their journey. And we're going to be a club that gets them from where they are now, at least a little bit further along the road to where they want to get to. We think the same about the staff. So it's probably very, very similar. And even though Michael Scabala might be 42 years old and not 24 years old, still his first job as head coach in the Football League. You know, Tom Shaw, who's an assistant head coach, he's still 36 years old and early in his coaching career. So even though they're older, in actually their journeys, they're quite young. So I think what that does is that gives them a huge amount of empathy and appreciation for the 24-year-old um, analyst who's going to sit in their office and how can they help them to develop? Because part of our job is to benefit from their expertise, but to help them develop in terms of the industry and in terms of how they interact with people. So we'd be very much collaborative here. Um, Michael doesn't have his own office. He sits in, he has a big office with the coaching staff and our analysts sit in that same office because we almost look at the two performance analysts as technical coaches. Like they have to see the game through the eyes of the coaches. So therefore, the more time they spend with them, the more meetings they're in, the more discussions they hear, the more that will help them understand what they're looking for when they go away and do all the prep and look at the opponent. So for us, it's incumbent on us to create an environment to develop players, but also to develop staff. And as long as they come with an expertise and as long as they come with a, a work ethic and a hunger to learn, we, we think we're, we're an environment that can really help them develop as well. You mentioned about the playing style, about engaging the fans in your playing style. Um, and I want to ask you about, there was a quote I heard from Eddie Howe who was talking to Guy Neville on one of those overlaps. And, and he talked about how when he started at Bournemouth in the lower leagues, it wasn't the style of football that he wanted. And then I, when I was preparing for this, I was thinking, oh, that's going to be, you know, to be respectful, lower leagues is maybe a bit more transitional style or maybe a bit more direct. And how do you get success in the short term, but maybe tier or, ta or aim for something a little bit more? <laughs> I think like, I listened to the same Eddie Howe podcast. It was good. Very good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it's rare, isn't it, that someone starts at the level Eddie starts at and gets to the absolute top level. So he's a he's an inspiration, I'm sure, for, for loads of young head coaches. Um, I, I hope Michael won't mind, and I'm sure he won't, that when he comes into his first role here as a, as a head coach in the EFL and has a limited amount of experience of, of League One, his first probably six to eight weeks was a real learning curve. Now, one of his strengths is He's smart. He's really, really intelligent. He's super analytical um, and he's a really hard worker. So that means he's a fast learner and he can pick up things really quickly. So when we talked in the very, very first time we met and he said to me, right, you know, tell me the club model. Tell me how the club wants to operate and, and how the game model has to fit into that, because the two can't be polar opposites and the two can't be competing against each other. The two have to have some synergy and have to fit together. And then he prepped or showed me his ideal way of, of how we would like to see his game model. Now, the reality is six or eight weeks later, he had to adapt because how he would like a team to play and how his vision of the perfect way of his team playing, yeah, you have to then do what's right for the players. You have to find the way that can give those players the best chance of success and the best chance of winning games. You have to play in a way I do honestly believe that represents your football club properly. I think clubs are here longer than any individual and it's incumbent on you to do enough work and to understand what the football club stands for and what the, the culture within the fan base is and what they want to see. Uh, and I'll talk about that more detail in a minute if you want, Gary, but more than just impose a style and go like, you know, I am a disciple of 
Pep or I'm a disciple of whoever and I am bringing this style to the club. No, no, no. The club's got to do its work to make sure that the coach that comes has a style that you believe is close enough to what the club wants and needs so that you're not fighting every day. You're not having debates or, or, or arguments almost because you've got two different paths that you want to go down. The, 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 the discussion is nuanced. The discussion is how quickly can we evolve and what do we need to tweak to make this effective for the group of players? So, yeah, may, maybe at the very start of this process, Michael had an idea. There's some things that haven't changed. So we, we're a really aggressive counter-pressing team. He came with that idea. And we believe that's a real, it's a very simple way that if you think about the average age of our team, the fact we can't maybe sign all the so-called best players in the league, um, that's a real good attribute for our team to have and a really good trait for our team to have to overachieve and be difficult to play against. But there'll be some parts of our game model in possession that have definitely adapted. But I think they'll continue to evolve, Gary. So I think that you never stand still. It's a constant evolution. Every transfer window can bring some slight change because you might have a couple of key relationships that create little nuance within your pattern and structure that when one's removed, that changes something else. And then you have to change four or five other pieces in the jigsaw to get the optimal. Um, but I think having an identity is really important. I think having a clear idea is important, but I think the detail has to evolve. And for every young head coach, if I had any advice, I would just say, have something that you're always working towards, but just accept you have to earn the right to get there and you can't impose it from day one. Maybe Pep Guardiola goes to Manchester City. Even he has a season where he's not successful in terms of what he's done since, where he has to get the players, that, the goalkeeper that can stay from the back, you know, fullbacks that will do what he wants to do. I think, you know, his first signings were like loads of fullbacks that can invert. I think... You, you can have an idea that you're working towards all the time. And if you have a successful enough coaching career, you may at one point in your career earn the right to be able to sign players that exactly fit it. But along the journey, there's always going to be a little bit of compromise and a little bit of adapt and adopt and a little bit of, yeah, working towards rather than being there at once. Stay on the evolution and, and talk now about evolution, uh, about mentalities you, you mentioned that a little bit earlier about the staff and the profile of the psychological profile of perhaps players coming in you got to be hungry they got to be driven when you go and watch like i would presume that when you sit in front of the player you'll normally get the you know similar to a job interview someone will tell you that they are those things and you, your margin of error in those with with limited resources is very very small At what how do you gauge that that aspect of motivation or drive for a footballer? Yeah, we um, we may do it a little bit differently. I don't know, but we we have quite a detailed presentation that we um, we go through with every single player that we want to sign. Sometimes that would be in this forum, you know, like on a Zoom call. Um, and, and if the if the process, you know, if, if a Zoom call is an hour and there's a lot of detail, you, you can quickly find out who's engaged. To be to be honest, like you can see who loves it and who wants to ask loads of questions and who's engaged and who's, you know, falling asleep and not that interested. So I, I would never say you're trying to judge is someone a good character or a bad character. I think you're trying to judge are their character that fit your club and are they going to, you know, it's almost like if we are really, really honest in our presentation and it's not for them, we're not the club for them. That's the reality. So we have to try and judge that where possible. We'll meet players in person and we probably do that. I don't know, 90% of the players, and then again, Gary, like spend more time with them. So get them up, show them around the city, try and spend some, you know, take them out for a bite to eat. So you get that off guard time with them as well. And then just do a huge amount of work, background work, check all the social media stuff, um, loads of character references over a long period of time. Like we've got a brilliant chief scout here called Mark Tracy, who knows so many people in football. Football's a village. Someone's played with someone who knows someone who knows someone. So you get... You try and get managers, you try and get teammates, you try and get people to come into contact with them. And it's an inexact science, so you do get the odd one wrong. But I also think it helps us as a football club that maybe one of the proudest things I have is that we are known to be something in England. You know, like, I'm not saying we're brilliant at it at all, as for others to judge, but I think we have an identity that people here would go, oh, that's a Lincoln City signing. That's the type of player Lincoln City would sign. Like, they... They want to develop young players. They want to give them a platform. 
if you go to Lincoln and you're hungry and ambitious, you've got a chance, you'll play games, you'll go higher. So I think almost having that identity almost attracts the right type of player for us as well. And the last thing is we don't pay the most money. So if you want the litmus test as to whether someone really is um, invested in their career and is going to come here for the right money, uh, sorry, come here for the right reason, it, it won't be money. Like we'll try and be competitive, but it won't, it won't be. They won't come here for financial reasons. So I think that does help us in terms of attracting the right, the right type of character. But yeah, loads of, loads of hard work, loads of speaking to them, loads of listening to them um, and trying to just, I think we have a real understanding of the type of characters that are really successful here. And, and we, we certainly work really hard to try and find them. Yeah. I saw so interesting. Um, like you, you've been around the game a, a while. Have you seen it change in the last five, ten years in terms of society, money, academies being perhaps a little bit different? Is it harder to get that drive? I guess that's what I'm asking. No, but I don't think I don't think football helps you get it from certain areas. So, so what by that I mean I think. I flip it. I feel sorry for the players sometimes. Now, you could say, don't feel sorry for them if they're on a crazy amount of money too early in their careers. But I think the players who are at the really biggest clubs and get put on really, really high wages at a young age, potentially before they've earned that by playing in someone's first team, um, I think it's really, really difficult for those players if they then are not successful at those parent clubs. I think it's really hard for them to transition into the real world, which is what finance looks in League One and League Two, what facilities look like, what expectations are. We we had a chat with someone this summer. I won't say who, but he's 25 years old. He came through as a very, very young age in the Premier League and he explained his first loan and he's like gobsmacked that he had to wash his own kit. He said no idea that that was something that he'd ever be asked in his life. And I think those bigger clubs have a real, and I think they understand this as well. And I think, you know, the ones we speak to and visit um, understand that that loan programme and like getting players out at a young age and trying to, um, experience what I would call the real world. Um, maybe they don't think that, but like what what that world looks like. I think where you shop for players is helpful as well. So we do look for players with a point to prove. We look to players who maybe have come from more humble backgrounds. Um, we shop in Ireland quite a lot. The Republic of Ireland is a really good market for us because there's no sense of entitlement from those young players they are desperate for an opportunity to come to England and they will do everything to try and grab that opportunity. Um, we try and look at players who may have come to the end of their pathway. We look at players who may have, yeah, played in League Two, played in the National League. You know, so players who know what it takes, have had some senior games, are ready for the battle of playing in League One, but have the potential and the ceiling to go higher. So I, th I think it definitely informs our recruitment processes and, and like the type of recruitment model that we have in terms of like trying to find the right characters as well. If you want to go to Ireland and do that recruitment job quickly and get in and out and do things wrong, you'll never sign a player. You know, like you have to do, we, we signed a, an example, Jack Moylan, and, and he was from Sh Shelbourne. So the first thing I went, I went to saw Damien Duff as the manager out of respect and try and do it properly and go through the front door and then meet Jack's mum and dad as, after meeting his agent and present to them the opportunity. So they're part of the process. And then obviously Jack, and then go back seven, eight times and watch him and make sure he knows so that in that whole process, it's not quick. That's the, that's the reality. Like for us to get a really good feel, like Jack's an example. Like we watch him as a player within 10 seconds of meeting him, I knew his character, like fire in his eyes, so determined. And he comes over and he plays with no fear. He's fearless. He, he's, he's so desperate for the opportunity. So that's a big thing for us, you know, because if we want a team to be fearless and play on the front foot and be really aggressive, we need players who can show that characteristic. And we need players who have got some resilience and have got a point to prove and are going to grab the opportunity. So, yeah, Jack's just one example, but the process takes a long, long, long time, Gary. And we have to be good at trying to execute those players that we're trying to sign into signings because the process takes so long. We can't do that with 20 players for every position. Yes, here we go. This is the, uh, this is, this is brilliant. A lovely little leeway. Jack comes in, does really well and say, say he does too well almost and attracts the attention of a Premier League club. Is there, 
as as much as we'd love to say that is great to a development model that obviously makes that winning on Saturday a lot harder when you're you know is there a way to manage that is that a challenge is that a threat or or the sell on model is that something that the club are up front with or is that something that yeah in in reality okay it's always hard for everybody to handle losing your best player but ultimately that's what we sell to the player as the biggest reason for them to come here so of course look, we're ambitious we want to get into the championship we you know in the last the club's played five consecutive seasons in the championship it's the longest in the club's history on one of those seasons we lost in the playoff final and this season just gone we went to the last league game and if we'd won that league game we'd have been in the playoffs and we missed a penalty at nil nil so twice in five years we've threatened promotion um, and for a club of our size we, that, 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 that that's pretty good but we're ambitious we don't want to stand still we want to keep striving for a, a place in that top six and promotion but we understand that with our model that might take two or three cycles that may take the recruitment of a player um, for a fee that we think is the right number um, and then at the point in their career that we can develop them and they have 18 months, two years. Uh, I'll give you an example. Harry Toffolo um, didn't get through the system at Norwich, went to Millwall in the championship, didn't play competitively in the championship, couldn't break through, comes to us 18 months, plays every single game in our first team, played 70 odd games. We sell him to Huddersfield, Huddersfield to Nottingham Forest. He's played 42 games in the Premier League. We take great pride in that. We benefit financially from it. He's on the slideshow, if you want, for the presentation when we're trying to sign the next player. There has to be an outcome like that. And you reinvest the money. And we're lucky that we're a football club where our owners take not one penny out of this football club, Gary. So we know everything that we earn will be reinvested to make the club stronger. So our the key to this is to make sure the protection of the club is right when the players come in. So we do sign players with great potential on long contracts. We back ourselves with our judgment that we get that right. And then we're protected so that we know that, I don't know, if a player signs a four-year contract, they're signing that, but we understand that the optimal time for them to leave may be after two years. When we're fully protected, they've played 80 games, they've excelled, there's an optimum time. Our job is then to get the best deal for the football club. But honestly, our job is also to help the player because if we're going to be the club that young players want to join, we have to be a club that is really, really invested in that young player beyond their career at Lincoln City. Like we have to help them in their career plan and we have to play a role in that. But we're doing that for the benefit of the football club by helping them move at the right time, reinvest it and start that cycle again. So can we be competitive in this league at the top end every single season? Sometimes that will be a challenge, but we've got to manage our contracts right so that we never lose too many in the same season. But there's always enough of a refresh in the squad every year to try and, you know, Everything needs changing and everything up needs updating. But yeah, contract management and the length of contracts when players come in mean it should be the absolute optimum outcome when someone has done their period with us, excelled for us, moved us forward on the pitch and then goes for the right money to the right club. And actually they then help move the club forward even beyond their time here. Management and, and obviously a long term a long-term vision, long-term strategic plan requires a certain personality. And you talk, you've talked a little bit about Michael, and we've had him on in the past, the podcast, and he's he was outstanding, really, really good. More of his futsal stuff, and just unbelievable. But talk about because I don't think we we get enough of an insight around this as a coaching community about the hiring process or about <laughs> how you find that coach or how you, you know, similarly like what you went through as a player of, of, of you know, assessing character or assessing fit. How do you find a manager that fits all the values and is in for it for the long haul? Really tough. I think we narrow the field a lot in terms of our player recruitment by the type of player that we want to recruit. So we we close the market. And then when you add to that, what's the finance that you can pay? It means that we have a, a smaller pool to fish from because we're so particular with what we want. And we do exactly the same. Let me tell you, we do exactly the same with the head coach. So that makes the job much, much harder in, in reality, because I think if we're just a club that almost lives in that world that will survive, we'll try and get a few results. Everybody knows that if he loses six on the spin, he's going to lose his job. And if he goes well, he goes well. And we're probably going to make two or three changes you know, every couple of years. Um, I think that makes the whole process a lot easier. For us, it's just not the world we want to operate in. 
So we want a co-architect. We want someone who comes in and believes in it, not just does it or not does it to get a job or not says they do it, but don't believe it. And then when the first moment comes, we're polar opposites in terms of our beliefs and there's no alignment. We just believe that there has to be true alignment with what the club's operating and how the club wants to operate and how the head coach wants to operate. So that means it's really rigorous and really difficult. And you probably end up, if you have two or three options at the end, you've done very well because those who have already achieved it in League One will quickly go on to the championship and higher and become out of our range. We know we're going to probably be a first job destination for head coaches. Um, so Michael will be typical of that. And in terms of what does that process look like, Gary, I think we're probably quite forward thinking in that we have a, a committee that meets regularly, um, you know, ownership and, and some exec and some senior directors. Uh, and part of my job is to create a database of head coaches, future head coaches, and go for a process even now when Michael's an incumbent, Michael is 100% secure, we love him, he's been brilliant, but I'll still meet people planning the future because we know one day Michael will leave us. And what my job is to do is to try and keep a good database, a good number of people that we've met, we've spoke to, we've got an opinion of, we've had that first introductory meeting. So it almost becomes like like recruitment does, it never stops. And then when the moment, you know, when the moment, when the music stops and you've got to find the person, um, you're a little bit better equipped to do that. Now, truth be known, we were probably in an early part of that process when when the job became available and therefore we're to accelerate that process over a period of a month. We were lucky that we have a guy called Tom Shaw who stepped up and was the interim head coach and bought us the time to do the process properly. But the first meeting with Michael was me with a couple of hours and Michael and a coffee. And it was almost that try and get underneath the bonnet and try and find out really what does this guy want to be, want to do. And being honest, after an hour, I told him, I, I feel like quitting my job and offering it to him because he'd be miles better at being a technical director than I could ever be because he's so intelligent. But he, he was clearly obsessed with coaching, developing players and being on the grass. And therefore, from that, we did a second interview with myself and my boss and, and Michael came and presented to us. And then once we got past that process, we would create as an exec uh, a short list that then went to interview with board and then ultimately ownership decision with, with exec recommendation, which would be myself and, and Liam Scully. So really thorough, really long. We'd look at, you know, I could tell you we can look at loads and loads of data from loads of managers, but the reality is we're not like Liverpool headhunting across the world who can pick on a slot because he perfectly fits. We're probably going to pick someone who's never done it before. So we're going on back to the first instance when I said about the analyst, we're going on competency. Is he really, really competent at what he does? Character and just alignment. Is, does he truly believe in operating in the way that we want to operate? And if there's an alignment, I think you can, yeah, you can work really well together. And, and Michael's got that. You've met him high IQ, high EQ, um, level of detail, work rate, obsessed with making players better, analytical, good thinker, really high, really strong reputation, loads of really good references. Look, took four games at the very, very highest level in the Premier League, stood, up, stood on the touchline at Old Trafford, doesn't get much bigger than that for a Leeds manager. Um, really good reputation within the FA. And you know what? We quite like the eclectic ex experiences that he had, you know, the, the, the mix of experiences and that his route was different and he had a massive point that... He wanted to prove in terms of being a head coach. And you know what? Through that whole process, Gary, he was interviewing us as much as we were interviewing him because the first time I met him, he was clear he couldn't get this wrong either because without that big playing background to fall back on, it would be really hard for him to get a second job if the first job didn't go well. So he was just as anxious to find alignment and make sure that we were a club that had process, wasn't going to fire off the six defeats, showed a level of due diligence that matched his personality character as, as well. I'm I'm glad you said about the about the interim process at Leeds because obviously you're right to stand in a touchline at Old Trafford uh is no small feat. And then also the, the, the futsal he was a head coach in that there. So there is some leadership uh, experience. I want to throw this one at you. A lot of because I talked to a lot of assistant coaches who have never done that and have never 
experienced the the interim role or, or anything so we're always kind of plugged as a number two we have aspirations for a number one what's your thoughts on assessing whether a number two because there's a lot made about whether they have the leadership or personality to command a change in room what are some things that you would say if you were looking at a number two or if you were advising a number two or how, how do you think they should manage that yeah I'll be open with you. Tom Shaw, who's our assistant head coach, we, we want to see if we can help him to develop in our building without leaving our football club to potentially be the head coach of the football club in the future. Now, the world doesn't always operate in a perfect way and that might not be possible, but that's our aim. So I think you could, like leadership comes in all forms, doesn't it? And of course, there's nothing quite to prepare you for what it feels like on that touchline like i did it for a bit and it there's nothing prepares you it's something different um so tom being able to take six games for us in the interim was a brilliant opportunity for us to give him that experience so he helped us brilliantly by giving us the time but we also gave him an experience that will benefit him but may in turn benefit us as a football club we saw how we operated under that pressure um we won some games we lost some games um so you're looking for a level of like, I, I I guess the word I would use is just like presence and authority. Like you have to, and everybody does that differently. So it's not a right and wrong. Michael does it differently. If you walked into our training ground during the week, I don't know if you'd immediately pick out he's our head coach. Doesn't walk around trying to prove that every minute of every day. He has a confidence in his ability. He's comfortable in his own skin. He's a collaborator. He convinces the players by the quality of his work not by you know how he walks or how he shouts or how he does anything else he's unassuming around the place um different people have their own styles i just think you have to command the respect of the players you have to be able to stand up so for example michael doesn't lead all of every meeting here other coaches jump in jump out they do some of the review of the games they do some of the prep of the opponent we do in possession out possession so again there's input there's more than one voice and i think someone in my job you know, I'm constantly observing, I'm constantly looking at people and you go, you believe they have some leadership traits that can be developed and then it's up to us to help them to develop. And that might be their pro license, it might be a coaching route, it might be going to see other people work and we've got to be bold enough as a football club to make people that employable that they could leave at any time but make the environment they work in that good that they never want to. So we have to create people who can work higher and, and then hope that what they have at the club, it would take an amazing offer for them to want to leave. That goes for Michael, that goes for the coaching staff and that goes for for the staff in general. So I think, yeah, empowering people to be leaders. Michael does it because he's not autocratic. You know, he's very much collaborative in his approach. Hence, office together debate everything, put your view, what would you do? And then there'll be a, an agreement that they reach. And we try and empower heads of department. And I think this is where this structure is much more beneficial than, you know, the old school manager, office, gaffer, God decides everything, everyone's subservient to them. I think my role is just simply to bring expertise into the building, into a structure that enables them to be empowered to lead their area of expertise help them work together so that we collaborate across the board and that there's never little silos operating in isolation, um, but really it's create leaders. And, and the more leaders we can create off the pitch as staff, and then the more leaders we can create on the pitch in players, the better chance you have a success. The the relationship between you and Michael, uh, head coach and, and technical director is obviously like, it's a new, it's a new part of football and, and we hear on the overlap every week about how difficult it is and all that good stuff. Um, something that we don't hear about a lot, you talk about there about the, the feeling on a touchline and how it can grab you as a head coach. Something that I always think about is when I'm watching a game is the, if it's the director of football, chief exec, technical director, sitting up 50 rows, final whistle goes, the booze come down, and the post-game, there's part of you that is a coach that's watched the game, but there's also, you mentioned processes. What would be a typical kind of post-game process in terms of you dealing with Michael and the head coach and kind of managing that 
the emotion of it and then taking that and then quickly getting ready for Wednesday or Tuesday even? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, there's no simple answer, is there? Like, yeah, I, I guess I've got to show a level of emotional intelligence as well because I remember the job. I remember doing it. I did it a long, long time ago, not very well for not very long. So, so, so let me tell you that first, but I do know what that feeling is. Um, I don't know if anybody feels worse after a defeat than the manager head coach. I think they, they wear it all like more than anyone. Um, I say a lot of times to Michael, it's so, so easy sat in the comfortable seats in the suit you know, like you can convince yourself you, you, you'd you make every decision, you see everything, you do everything. One of the things that astounds me is how managers and head coaches see anything at ground level. I, I think it's such a difficult skill to see the, the, the tactical nuance of the game. We do it a little bit differently. We have one of the coaching staff on the gantry in the first half um, to give a bird's eye view and mic'd up to one of the other coaches. Um, but I think... Yeah, look, you know, sometimes you watch from above and all of, all the head coach wants to do is break the fourth official. I, I don't get that. I think at the very, very least to have a chance of knowing what's going on, you just have to focus on what, what's happening. Yeah, there's a few rules I would have to myself, which is go down whatever the result. If you're going to shake hands and be happy when you win, go and shake hands when you lose. So keep out the way, get in the tunnel, but make sure you look every player in the eye and shake their hand when we've got beat as much as when we've won. Um, I think then that after the game, we have a, a football office in the, in the, in the, you know, stadium near the dressing room at home games and get in that afterwards and judge the mood and sometimes try and pick people up. Sometimes the result can be wrong, but the performance looks miles better from where I'm sat than the emotion of the defeat. So just, be what Michael needs for Michael at that moment, not what it is for me. To so try and gauge what he needs in that immediate aftermath of the game. There's that British culture where the opposing coaching staff come in for a beer after football games. That 90% of the time happens. It's very rare that it doesn't happen, in fairness. You know, like there has to be a, a big old bus stop on the touchline for, <laughs> for, for it not to happen. Um, and it now involves... Not to, it used to be the manager, then the coaching staff. Now it's like anyone who can grab a beer and a bit of pizza. So it's like the analysts and the, you know, the kit man and everybody comes in. Um, and that's a really interesting part because it's sort of like tradition. And, you know, unless you get someone that you really know, there's almost that sort of, you know, when they leave and they've won and, you know, you think, oh, like, yeah. Thank God. There's, 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 there's some managers like a bit of emotional intelligence about how the other one feels when they've lost. But once that's died down, you sort of get the feel for, does he want to talk? Does he not? Does he want some opinion? Does he not? And I just sit in the office, really, and try and gauge the mood and be careful with my opinions as to what's needed. And Michael quite often just rings me on the way home and we'll have a chat. But I suppose what I'm saying, Gary, there, that's too much detail. It needs to be, I think, I need to react off what he needs. And I need to wait for what he needs rather than trying to be imposing. And the longer you go, the more you know the person and the more you instinctively probably know how they feel and probably know what they need. And then absolutely, in my book, leave them alone on Sunday. Let them family day away. I know he'll watch the game back twice. I know he's going to be prepped and ready on Monday. And then I, I always see on Monday in football clubs, Whatever the pain might have been at five o'clock on Saturday, it's never there at nine o'clock on Monday because Monday is back to work, get in early, review the game, clip the game, make sure we're ready for the meeting. Quite often in England, Monday is review Saturday and prep Tuesday because the mad world we live in of 50 odd games. Um, so I think it is just that hour or two after the game of just trying to be what they need you to be. Never lie, never tell them what they want to hear if it's not the truth but you don't need to go imposing yourself on them and opposing opinions on them because you have to feel the empathy because it is, they've lived the emotion because they're on the touchline. Whereas even in my role, as much as I want us to win, I am, I am one degree removed from that emotion by being in the stand. Yeah. Again, I love it, but I think it's a lot harder than, you know, I think you're, you're, you're selling that one a bit short and that's kind of my next question is, how did you learn that? Like, how did you learn from, because you're, as a coach, you're almost conditioned to fix, fix, suggest, uh, act, act, I suppose. And you're saying that you're, you're kind of 
you know, you don't want to impose is a great way of, you know, great way of putting it. But I, I wonder in your development to, for that role, is that something that you've learned or is that something that is just natural to your personality? It's the opposite of my personality, Gary, to be honest. Yeah, 100 percent I'd be impatient, outcome driven, want to get there quick, all of those things. Um yeah, it's probably the benefit of of grey hair. It's just probably it there's not many, but it's probably that, just living it. And it really, really, really helps that the head coach can really help or make that really difficult. Like I've worked with some head coaches who it's really, really difficult to read. Uh, and to know what they want. I think some are really, really volatile. Michael's nature makes it much, much easier because if he's he's measured, he's calm, he he's analytical. So he, he's, his first instinct after the game is to mentally review the game, like logically, rather than slam door, shout, do stuff like this. Um, do you know what I think it is as well? I think if you, I think these are the moments you know how strong the respect and trust is. I think I couldn't have more respect for Michael. I've got absolute respect for him. I really like him as a person, but I've got massive, massive respect for him. So I think in those moments, the trust that he would have that I'd only say what I thought would benefit him and vice versa is really, really important. I think you can only really, really help people if you've built a level of respect and trust. I think it's the same with the players. I think really good coaches are the ones who can affect players. Everyone can put on a training session. Everyone can put on a coaching session. Everyone can stand in front of a group and lead an analysis debrief. I think the way you affect players are if they really, truly believe you're doing it for their benefit. And that comes from a trust and a respect that you have to build. And I think coaches who think you can shortcut that are wrong. I, I just think that's a failing. I think you have to build that and you build it by your work every day, being true to your word, constantly putting the player first. Like I talk all the time, whenever we talk to players, it's not about old guys with grey hair in suits on match day. Like our future as a football club, our status as a football club is defined by what the players do on the football pitch. Every single person at the football club's job should be in one way or another to support the players. So for us, I think yeah, that also is true of the relationship between director of football, head coach. We all know there's going to be difficult moments, but I think if you've got true trust, true respect, they're just bumps in the road that you get through. And everyone's conditioned in football. Like, so one good thing, Gary, is we all know, don't we, that even if you're successful, you'll lose games. So we we are resilient people in football. Like You know you're going to get criticism. You go from being the worst to the best at your job publicly in terms of what people think of you by three or four results. So I think you you do create a level of like self, you self-regulate how you feel after games. So you can be hate losing, you can, it can eat you up, but you also know how to conduct yourself and how to behave and you know how to deal with it. And, and you learn that, you know, the, the, the aftermath of a game, always conducting yourself properly. And then if you've got real true trust, I think, hour later car journey home you speak to each other and it's like right it's just you and them and it's like how they really feel and i think if you can create that relationship that's a, a real help to the head coach well, that's fascinating fascinating um last couple for you the commercial aspect as well obviously is something that has increased over the last few years around the world and especially in america where people are now trying i think to get a return on on their on their investment and i i wonder is there sometimes that there does that maybe not align with the football side and and then this might be a, just a random question but would you ever think that doing like an amazon type or netflix type documentary around it <laughs> would you ever go do you know what that's 10 million but we you know that might actually impose on some of those relationships yeah, if it was 10 million, we'd do it because we'd, 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 be we'd be able to pay 500 pounds a week more and get some players. Um, no, nah, I think, do you know what? I think the top, top players are just so used to cameras. Mm. You know, like if you're Man City, everywhere, I don't know, Phil Foden, he's an unbelievable football player, isn't he? He's a young man, but from the second he's broken through, he's had media attention, 
cameras, everything's live. Pretty much every game they play is live. I just think they become accustomed to it. So I think if you put a camera in the Manchester City dressing room and you do a documentary, I, I, I'm not sure that changes anything. I think at our level, it's massively different. I think the yeah, look, if you can massively benefit your football club by having something like a documentary that would have value, and look, Wrexham have obviously done it very, very skillfully, haven't they? And they've leveraged the ownership and, and they've been dead smart and they've created a brand that's miles, miles bigger than the football club, potentially, in terms of what they've done in America. And you tip your hats to them and, and whatever. But you have to also be cognizant of, like, be what you are. Like, we're Lincoln City. We're, you know, a bit, a bit east off the A1. Like, no one quite knows where we are. We know that. We're not London. We're not Bright Lights. We're not the glamour club. We, we won't be. So then back to the point about type of characters, we're, we're going to get honest, hard workers. We're going to get people who are humble. We're going to get people who aren't signing for a club for the Instagram hits or the acclaim or the perception. They're here for the real reason. They're here to work really hard and be really successful and do their best in football. Um, I think that's what our supporters like. You know, we, we've got a city that really represents a county. We're a really rural county. We've got a beautiful centre and a historic part to our city. There's a big cathedral that you can see for miles and miles around. When you come from a different part of the country, I don't come from Lincoln, but you can really see the pride that the people have in their football club and their city. So you want to attract people who have that. What I'm saying is I don't think, therefore, that we probably make the best documentary, to be honest. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm not sure that that sits well. But I think what we have to be is we just have to be commercially aware of everything. And we we want to be real. We want to be real. We want to, we want to be the club that, yeah, does our work diligently, is a really good opportunity for players to come to, really good opportunity for staff to come, create a football team the club are proud of. Do you know what? One of the best moments last season, it was crazy. I've never seen anything like this in football. We conceded the second goal against Portsmouth in the last game which basically meant we're now not in the playoffs. It was the 99th minute. It's a breakaway. We're going gung-ho for the for the goal. And usually in football stadiums, especially nowadays, isn't it? It's like fashionable. You either boo or yeah. you leave. You know, like you never, you don't, it's one of those two reactions. The entire 9,000 Lincoln fans stood up and just started clapping the players. It was like a standing ovation from 9,000 people as we're waiting to kick off season done in that moment of disappointment. And, you can see that that comes from a pride in what the team had done and what the players done. And it means a lot to the staff and the players. So creating that bond is really important. I think the club is brilliant at engaging with supporters and not making them feel like customers, like genuinely feeling like they are, they are the moral owners of the football club. It's their football club. We're here to serve them. We're here to provide a football team that they enjoy watching, you know, Quick history lesson, iconic managers in the past for Lincoln City, Keith Alexander, um, Graham Taylor, Colin Murphy, Danny Cowley, like two up front, quite direct football. So we have to produce a modern, direct, front foot, aggressive way of playing because that will engage our support base. Like not be a club who plays 50 passes to get to the halfway line because we've got a philosophy. So everything we do has to be real and it has to connect. And I think if you have that connectivity with the supporters, our job is to have a football team that we need a bigger stadium, we can improve the stadium, we can develop the stadium, we get more people in, grow the fan base. And I think that long-term way of adding commercial strength to the club, engaging the business community, the commercial team here do that really well. Maybe everything we do has got to have like long-term value and have some real solid foundations so that ultimately we can change the status of the club rather than yeah, try and do a quick fix and, and bring some money in. Sorry, that was probably too long an answer to the question, but if you know what I mean, I think everything we have to do has to be short term because we know it's the industry. We have to perform. We have to win. It's every Saturday, every Tuesday. We're conditioned to know that, but it has to have like long term sustainability and long term benefits so that the next generation can enjoy a better football club than the previous. And that's the legacy that everybody leaves behind. Last one for you then on on you know, a follow up on the one I asked earlier about about your role and and something that again it's coming into football and you know I think twenty years ago it was coaches were coaching a lot because 
it was paying the bills and it's what you did uh, on a Saturday, you know, and you, you took your lumps and you you did it again on Monday, you got yourself up. And now you're starting to see, especially in the States, I think you're starting to see people around 40s, 50s saying, you know what, I'd like to take a different role in the game and I'd like to manage a bit more and manage head coach and support people. And What would you advise people who are kind of going through that aspect of, Maybe they've stood on a touchline and maybe they've just decided, you know what, uh, I, I still think I've got something to offer, but I, I don't fancy that role particularly. I do I do like the idea of becoming a technical director. What are some things you would say that could prepare you for it or could put you in good stead and learn a skill set for it? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, th I think it is becoming more of a, a job people aspire to. I think in England, we've almost got like a time lag. I think this has been a, a really really respected role on the continent um, and it's only just starting to become that in England and to start with it becomes respected in the Premier League and eventually like reluctantly probably especially among some supporters of you know what what on earth does a director of football do and it should be a manager and there should almost be a single point of successful failure that everybody can see when actually the way football is developed is I just think it would be impossible for one person to run a football club like they did 20, 25 years ago. The level of detail that players demand, how players come through academies, the technical detail, the quality of coaching, the analysis, talk about recruitment. It's now a global market, not a domestic market. So I think it's, for me, it's like trying to get as many different experiences as possible. Um, not be afraid for those to be at different levels. Um, there's, you know, fortunate now may be that there's academic qualifications and, and courses that, you know, give a real insight into this role and I think are like really, really beneficial. And like yourself, Gary, I, I know some players who probably played for me when I was a manager or assigned in previous roles who are getting to that early 30s part where they're thinking about the next, you know, three or four years, maybe transitioning from playing into some level of, of role. And, and some of those see this role as far more suited to their personality, character and and probably um, job security um, that, than being a head coach or the manager. And, and I just think the bit I've been probably fortunate at, fortunate with without any particular planning has been just to see a cross section of roles um, across football clubs and and doing that head coach's job for a little or manager as it was then as, for a period of time gives you empathy of that role, but just having an understanding. So maybe if someone wants to do this role, I think they may transition from like a youth development background. So it'd be through an academy system where they can then go and get a real expertise and then lead an academy. And then the next role may be to, to become a technical director, or it might be through recruitment, you know, leading a recruitment department and having that as an expertise. Um, I think quite a lot of performance analysts go into that quite young and then evolve into recruitment and then, and then on. And even that step from being a manager to being a director of football, I think that that's true as well. So lots of routes in. I would just gather as many experiences as possible because I think when you do this role, really, mo I tell you how I feel in most meetings: the least expert in the room. <laughs> that's the truth. So what you have to just, I think, is have a knowledge enough of what their roles are, and what their challenges are, and what their day-to-day -day stresses and and yeah it is challenges on a day-to-day -day basis so you can support them as best you can and on occasion check and challenge and make sure that we embed some good practice so i think it's having an overview and the more you can get experiences of different departments different roles i think it leads to um being able to do this role better yeah i definitely think we're heading for in 10 years the, the players in the current generation are not going to want to coach no chance you get you get a different people, don't you? You get the ones who are yeah, just love that as an idea. But let's be honest, as a profession, we don't help people or encourage people to want to do it, do we? When clubs make decisions so quickly and it's so tenuous and it's so yeah, there's, there's no security. So yeah, football's got to do a better job as well. Half the time, Gary, I think it is people get sacked quickly because there's not enough due diligence in the appointment. Like I think if if a club doesn't understand what they want to be and what their model is and they don't understand therefore the qualities of who they're trying to recruit you just become slave to results and therefore when results go badly the easiest thing to do is sack the manager and appoint another one 
I think for us, we really, really try, and it's a big benefit of this football club, comes from ownership, comes from Clive, comes from Harvey, stability, having a stable football club where we're measured in our decision-making, calm in our decision-making, and then you create an environment that you can attract someone of the calibre of Michael Scabala because that's what he wants because he knows that's the environment he needs to be successful. So, yeah, I think defining what you are, having your strategy, having your plan, knowing the type of head coach that you need to recruit and then knowing the processes that you want to see just gives everybody um, an opportunity to look beyond results um, and gives you a little bit more of a longer-term lens. And it's tough in a short, in an environment where you're constantly judged over the short term, but I guess that's where you have to have some belief in what you're doing and try to be a little bit different because if we do the same as everything everyone else we'll come 12th to 15th in the league, which is where our budget is. We have to take some risks, um, calculate your risks with big rewards and big upsides to try and overachieve. Fantastic. Fantastic. What a way to finish it. Jess, thank you so much. That was amazing. It's been a pleasure.